Hey everyone, welcome to The Fin Factor. I'm Paul. And I'm Aaron. And this is episode number 60. 60! Any guesses? Rourke Chartier? Oh! Yeah? Not the one I thought you would okay. guess. Okay. Who's right. the other one? I don't know. Who's the other one? Daddy? Oh, that's right. Jason Demers. How could I forget? Come on, man. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. That's it. Those wow. two. Just those. Yeah, huh? I'm surprised you got Rourke Chartier. I, yeah. Well, he was the... the He's been on the team more recently, I guess, is the point. Okay, anyway. Sure. So, uh, cool. Well, this episode, we're going to talk about the uh, couple games that we had. Only two this past week. Uh, the Sharks played one up, one down. That's okay. Um, we're also going to talk about some of the lines. I know that's kind of been a topic with people uh, having their opinions, if you will. Yep. We had a special interview going back to the Fan Fest with uh, Curtis from Teal City Crew. And uh, we'll take a look at the week ahead, as well as our fantasy hockey leagues and EASHL teams. Very good. Well, you ready to start the show? Ready. Okay, I'm going to give you some wise words my dad told me. He said, Paul, shut up. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> So the Sharks uh, most recently, or earliest in the week, had played a game against the Carolina Hurricanes. And uh, wow, what a first period it was. Yeah, no kidding. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, so Evander Kane scores a hat trick in the first period, the first time in franchise history that a player has done that. Um, people were a little confused, calling it a natural hat trick. Now, he did score three Sharks goals in succession, but unfortunately... One hurricane goal got uh, in between there, broke it up. So that's not considered a natural hat trick. A natural hat trick would be three goals in succession by the same player, regardless of team. In the same period? Uh, no, it doesn't have to be in the same period. Okay. It just has to be in succession. He was able to do a hat trick in the first period, which is amazing, mm -hmm. right? But it was not considered a natural hat trick. So there was a little bit of confusion there. Just wanted to clear that up for people who were uh, maybe a little bit confused by that. So. Uh, there was that, but Evander Kane, what a huge first period he had! Um, just amazing stuff. You can't write this. So yeah, that line's kind of been on fire. I think both games, uh, that game and the Buffalo game, mm -hmm. they stood out to me. Uh, going back to the playoffs, I feel like in the definitely in the first round last year, uh, that hurdle line is has been phenomenal. And and I don't know, I can't remember if Hurdle was even playing with Kane last year, um, like predominantly, but. This year, they those two have some great chemistry, and uh, LeBanc's been on that line as well, at least for this last couple this week. So um, those guys just they seem very dangerous on the ice every time they get the puck. Uh, they're creating chances. They're scoring goals now, finally. So um, it's very fun to watch because they really get that cycle down low mm -hmm. and, and really wear out the other team. And a lot of times, especially in the second period when they get stuck out on the ice on the long change, um, they, they're really creating chances. And... Uh, I thought they looked great. Yeah. I think Hurdle looks awesome. I think Kane well deserved uh, hat trick in the first period, which is just <laughs> nuts. Like, obviously you don't see that because that's never happened, right. at least in the Sharks' history. And I won't ask Super Producer Jason to uh, put it up on the screen, but there was a Twitter thing with me and someone going back and forth saying, "Well, what's Kane done for you lately?" kind of thing. And I said, <laughs> "Well, he's got one tonight when he scored the first one, and then uh, he got the second goal. I put two happy faces as my reply. He got the third goal, and I put three hats." So I was like, yeah, I kind of, you know, silenced the critics all in one period. Nice. How beautiful is it, right? Uh, not so beautiful, however, the uh, following game uh, against the Buffalo Sabres. That I actually had the pleasure of going to that game. Before we get into the sad stuff, I want you to look right over my <laughs> shoulder here, and you can see the Los Tiburones uh, jersey that they gave away at that game. Um, really cool stuff, really nice bright colors. Um, everyone was, was uh, really digging on it. They had the artist there that did it, and cool. he was... In one of the suites, they had the camera on him. He was waving. People were cheering. It was, it was really loud and everything. So, um, again, this kind of the, the happy moment, <laughs> if you will, uh, from that game. Uh, the the not-so-happy moment, however. <laughs> right. i uh, talking about Eric yeah, Carlson's yeah. kind of giveaway there. Yeah, I, it kind of baffled me when I saw this. I was watching it live at home, and yeah. I was like, wow, did he really just do that? And they showed the replay. I'm like, he did. He's, he capped the puck. He went around the net. And instead of banging it up the boards, which is the safer play, um, or even making kind of a direct pass on the stick somewhere. Uh, he kind of put it up the middle, and he, it almost like he healed it a little bit, and then it was going to Sorensen, and I think he was kind of even shocked that mm -hmm. it was coming towards him. Uh, Sorensen was right in front of Jones in, in the slot area, and he just couldn't get a handle on it, and it was a bad turnover right to the other team. To me, it was like that's a play that an AHLer makes, right? Mm -hmm. Not an NHL veteran. Um, just going up the middle, especially in a tie game, at that point, was six, seven minutes left in the game. That's just dumb, in my opinion. So I and I'm not 
I don't want to bag on Carlson because there's a lot of people that do that. I'm not. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just like I'd like to see him on the defensive end, kind of make a little bit more conservative plays. Know the know the kind of situation, the game situation, the game clock, all that stuff um, before making those kind of plays because he is a high risk, high reward type player. Right. He made amazing plays in the game. I'm not taking anything away from him. Uh, he did have two power play assists in that game, but he ended up on a minus three. Mm-hmm. So he, he was on the ice for three of the four goals. And uh, unfortunately, you know, plus minus isn't everything because the two he had two power play goal or assists. Yeah. So he's, he's not going to get a plus one to offset his minus three. Um, so he was on the ice a lot for five goals. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that turnover was just rough for me. It's, it's just silly. And I... I I'm pretty sure he probably, I don't know if he got yelled at for it, but I'm sure he's seen the tape and goes, okay, I have better options. I should do that. Yeah, it's a better. teaching moment. It's a learning yeah. moment. You know, d- despite, you know, the amount of money he gets paid and his experience and how phenomenal he is uh, with the puck, there are always moments where you're going to be able to, you know, take a look at something you did and improve your game, right? So um, he's not exempt from that. Now, for me, I know you're saying, you know, put it up around the boards. If you look at that play again, I think Marco Bird Vlasic is in the corner behind him, and usually you just kind of backhand it off the boards mm-hmm. to your defensive partner. Uh, that would have, for me, would have been the safest play. There was no saber on that side of the rink, so yeah. I, I would have thought that that's kind of the play that he would make. Now again, hindsight's twenty twenty. I had the benefit of going through replay and not having someone breathing down my neck <laughs> with the puck. Uh, but you know, this is a professional athlete, and yeah, I think they they practice these things over and over again. So. Um, if Marco Board Vlasic is not yelling to him, hey, puck, right, um, then that's kind of on both of them as defensive mm-hmm. partners. I mean, there's multiple options in that situation. Yeah. And this is what they practice, you know. There's there's certain options that are riskier than others. Yeah. Or some that are more conservative than others. And he chose probably the most riskiest <laughs> option yeah. there was. Um, <laughs> again, with six, seven minutes left in the game. Turns, you know, turns the puck over and Buffalo put it in the back of the net. And they, I feel like the Sharks played well in this game. It's just that Buffalo took advantage of the chances that they got with the mistakes that the Sharks made, mm-hmm. especially this one. Um, and there are other goals, too. Uh, there was the high-touch goal. Yes. You want to talk about that a little bit? Well, the high-touch goal, it confused me to no end. So I was at the game again, Jersey. Uh, I wasn't able to watch it with the benefit of replay and uh, broadcasters slowing everything down, color commentary, breaking down for you and everything. I'm sitting there like watching what's going on and then my replay is at the Jumbotron, which they do like once or twice, right? So I see the goal go in and we're going, ah, I think that's a high touch, so I think it's a high touch. And then, you know, they, they go and do the, the review of it and it turns out they say, okay, no goal. Now, to me right there, that should be the end of it. They've stopped, looked at the play, reviewed it, were convinced enough that they overturned the call when you're overturning the call on the ice, that means you're pretty definitively saying, yes, we were wrong, we got it right now. Apparently what happened was it wasn't that they looked at it again and decided, no, we were right the first time. It was that Toronto had mm-hmm. called in and said, no, you guys got it wrong. So Toronto kind of vetoed yeah. <laughs> their their decision on that, which I don't know. I, I feel like if if the how much power do you take away from the referees really at, in these situations, you know? So it's like if they're going to look at it and say, "No, we were wrong. We got it right now." Um, Toronto can still call in. Then why even have the ref there? Why don't you just have Toronto make the call in the first place I for think, any of these? I think going back a couple, you know, episodes in the summer, we were talking about replays. Mm-hmm. I, that's what I felt like should happen is that Toronto is the one that makes the end all be all calls on goals, penalties, whatever. Right. Um, just take it off the rest because you have people in the booth in Toronto that are watching every single play, every single angle of yep. everything, right? They're going to have a lot quicker response than the referee going, making a call, then getting called, buzzed in or whatever, or, or a challenge too, and they have to skate over to the monitors, get everything set up, look at it, put their headsets on, talk yep. with Toronto. Like it just, to me, it's a time waster and you don't want that. You don't want it to be the NFL. Right. You don't want it to be right. wasting so much time. Um, but going back to the high touch... I don't really have a problem with it, per se. I feel like the Sharks kind of get the short end of the stick in these situations, <laughs> if, without the uh, the pun <laughs> intended there. Um, I, I just, to me, the NHL has a goal scoring problem, and it's bad for them to take away goals. This one is such a, like, um, it was so close. And in yep. the replay, the guy, I forget who it was. Was it Johansson or was God, it? I don't remember. Gregor- Gregerson's. He. He put his stick up and was bringing it down, 
and it was weird because he was swatting it down and the puck hit the top and actually went up it didn't go down mm. so it was kind of a, a play on your eyes when you're watching it and they had a really good angle of it on the TV um, almost like you can see the puck and then it goes up yeah. and it was super slow-mo so it was really easy to watch think, thankfully for TV so um, I, I think I'm not so bad with that call I think and Pete DeBoer actually talked about it they asked about him after the game and he said he didn't have a problem with that he had a problem with the non-icing call right before that uh, you were there you saw it happen right was it as um, was, who was it you know and we, we talked about Ferraro, this it was Ferraro, right? but we talked about this in the live uh, right before the show which by the way if you're not subscribed subscribe so you can know when we're doing the live shows because they are phenomenal I enjoy the interactions a lot um, but we talked about this during the live and it was you know things are going to happen in the game that we don't necessarily agree with unfortunately uh, an icing call is a very subjective call right it's it's up to their discretion whether the player would or would not have beaten out the other guy um, that's something that's very subjective as opposed to like a blue line call right where it's are you talking about offsides either the puck is over or the puck is not and either the foot is over or the foot is not right that's more objective for something like icing it's kind of up to their discretion so you know, whether it would or would not have mattered, there's, again, with this whole butterfly effect, you can't really say that, okay, that a goal would not have happened. Maybe five goals would have ha- would have happened if, you know, that uh, had been called an icing and brought back, and who knows, right? So, um, to me, the, my take on that is, yeah, it's it's a bummer that that's essentially what, what kind of set them up for that goal, but... You know, there's a whole lot of hockey to be played, and y- you got to just take whatever comes at you and just play your game. No matter what happens, sometimes you're going to get good bounces, sometimes you're going to get bad bounces. Look at the goal Marcus Sorensen scored, where he just turned a right. skate blade and it happened to deflect perfectly. That was a beautiful tip. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a Pavelski level tip with a skate. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it, I don't think he meant to do that. That's just a really good bounce. So sometimes it's going to go your way, sometimes it's not. The only thing you can do is not complain about it, put your boots back on, and go back to work. And the Sharks did just that. I yeah. thought they were pressing really hard, and I thought I thought for sure they were going to tie the game up with less than two minutes left, and Jones pulled out of the net. Mm-hmm. So um, they were pressing really hard. That hurdle line was looking so good again, yeah. like just consistently looking good. And um, they had their chances. It's not like Olmark made some good saves, mm-hmm. but the Sharks had some great A chances that they just could not bury, they could not finish. And we've kind of seen this happen. I think this happened last year, last season where they had all these chances and couldn't bury him, and then the floodgates opened up. Yeah. And I'm not saying the Sharks are going to score as many goals as they did last year, but the ship is getting righted. And, in fact, in that game, uh, in the last minute, mm-hmm. we saw Hurdle win a bunch of faceoffs uh, in a row. I think he had three in a row. Um, yeah. In the offensive zone, goalie pulled very, you know, that's clutch time right there. Yep. And I thought for sure, I was watching, I was like, man, I wonder how many faceoffs they're going to win or how many they're going to miss. And, then they're going to have to, you know, chase the puck, and it, they won and won and won. I was like, wow, this, they're going to score. They're going to, yeah. it's going to happen. It didn't happen, but, but you got that feeling. And again, they were, they're always in that game, right? Mm-hmm. And again, put the boots back on and go to work. They did. And Hurdle again, three, I think it was three faceoffs in a row that he won in the offensive zone, uh, giving them a chance every single time. And then that, unfortunately, four seconds left, I think is what it was, and that last face off, you couldn't get it. But, um, you know, again, it, it, just a phenomenal job by that line. Now, remember when Hurdle was playing on the wing, you know, when everyone was saying, oh, I don't really like him at center. <laughs> I like him at center now. How about mm-hmm. that, right? He's really solidified himself as the number two center, if you will, on, on this team. And, uh, you know, he's a guy, he's a, he's a go-to guy. Right. So you've got uh, Couture, uh, the Couture line. You've got the Hurdle line. You've got Jumbo now, right? So... Some people having some opinions about whether or not certain players <laughs> belong with certain other players. Right. You see where I'm going with this, right? Yeah. Um, so, I, did you want to kind of address the, the yeah. fan base a little bit? With <laughs> sure. I mean, there was a question about uh, Barkley Goudreau being on the third line with Jumbo, and I don't know who asked this. I, I don't know. If, I think it was Kevin Kurz. I can't remember, but um, he asked in the post game. Uh, I don't know if a post actually pregame, but mm-hmm. he asked Pete DeBoer. You know, Jumbo, he's been around a while. He kind of likes having certain guys on his line. And Gaudreau's kind of been there, kind of kind of been there. And Sorensen just came back, right? Mm-hmm. You know, does does Joe like having Gaudreau on his line? Is he one of the guys that he prefers? And Pete said, like, basically, yeah. Like, and In fact, here, we'll just play the quote right here. Yeah. Is that a guy he likes, <laughs> he likes playing with? Yeah, I think so. I, I think jo- Joe wants workers, you know, around him. I think, you know, it's funny, but, you know, you, you would think, you know, one of the best – passers of all time and one of the greatest offensive players of all time would want the most skilled guys around him but you know it shows you what his 
game really is based about. He wants he wants guys that are willing to put the puck in and work and and uh, you know get dirty uh, or the guys he likes to play with and um, so that's a testament I think to his game too. So you can see that Jumbo kind of was for Goudreau having him on his line, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know how much say Jumbo has in, like, I want this guy on my yeah, line, yeah. but um, I, I'm sure it's probably a mix of both him and Pete DeBoer. Um, but it's kind of telling that he didn't want Kevin LeBanc on the line, maybe? I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah, I don't know if I read into it that much, to yeah. be honest with you, but I do like that he said he likes workers. He wants guys that are workers, you know? That's um, why I was saying that. Well, I don't think Joe would throw him under the bus quite like that, right. though. So, um, I, I don't know. I, I do like that Joe is one of these guys who says that. You know, he wants the guys that are going to go in and, and work, right? Um, the guys that are the more skull guys, like say like a Kevin LeBanc, mm -hmm. that kind of helps push them up the lineup, right? So that helps them solidify those top scoring lines. And Joe being Joe, like you said, you can make your son a 20-goal scorer, right? right? So um, <laughs> if he's able to do that with Barkley Goodrow now, I mean, that certainly helps. And if he's a, a worker type guy, he's going to go retrieve the puck. So Joe's, you know, 40-year-old body doesn't really have to. Uh, so... I don't know. I think it's it's great. I haven't. Uh, I had my doubts with Barkley Goodrow being on that line. I felt he was a great fourth line guy. I'm not saying he wasn't skilled enough necessarily to play there, but I just felt like he was a good fit on the fourth mm -hmm. or on the low utilization line. If I was been calling it earlier, uh, but you know, I have to say he's he's really surprised me. I think he's done a really great job playing uh, in that scoring type of role. He has, I think, three goals on the season now, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Um, which you know, we're only a handful of games in. Having three goals at this point is pretty good. You know, for a guy like Barkley Goodrow, who nor would right. normally be, you know, in the checking role. And in that same interview uh, that Pete DeBoer, um, I didn't put it in this clip, but mm -hmm. uh, he he did say how Goodrow looked. He looked liked how he looked. He was faster than he was last year, and uh, getting a little bit more ice time and kind of more skill. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that little, you know, the goal against Vegas <laughs> that that he scored in Game Seven kind of put him on the radar a little bit. Of well, <laughs> this guy can actually, you know, he's got yeah. some skill. Not that he. We didn't think he did, but he's got a little bit of scoring touch. Mm -hmm. And again, most players do growing up, especially now. You Growing up, you're probably the best scoring kid on your team. Right. Um, up until you get to close to the NHL level, then you're kind of like, oh, wow, like this is not what I <laughs> was thinking was going to be my NHL career path, being on the fourth line grinder kind yeah. of thing. Guess what, but, kid? You're going on the boards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, But anyway, uh, good on Gaudreau to, um, to kind of get bumped up to the third yeah. line, if you will. And getting a little bit more minutes and a little bit more trust from both uh, Jumbo and, and I don't know what's what's better to have trust with Jumbo or trust <laughs> with Dupour. Uh It's probably good to have both, but yeah. uh, but it's good on him. So his career is looking pretty good now. Sounds awesome. I cannot wait to see how the rest of the uh, the season shakes out. Yeah. I know there's going to be that line blender that goes on, and we've seen Kevin LeBanc kind of go up and down that that right hand side. So uh, it'll be fun and interesting to watch. I will say this uh, on the topic of lines and who's on what line and whatnot um again it's very early in the season give it a while to shake out we did talk about like last season we were seeing you know give it about 20 games so we kind of like figure out you know where this team's really kind of headed and who's got the chemistry and everything else so uh the things that you're seeing now in terms of lines i know there's maybe some criticism for those um i think aaron kind of flushed those out a little bit just now <laughs> but um, do give it some more time. Don't panic right away. Um, it's not something that you have to set the lines like in NHL 20 or something like that. And that's those are your lines. Yeah. It's 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 fluid, right? So uh, we'll see how it goes. And we certainly know that Pete DeBoer likes to put them in the in the line blender. So yeah. very good. We're done with that. Um, we actually got a chance. It was during Fan Fest. Yes. Uh, to sit down with Curtis, who is the president of Teal City Crew. They are a uh, supporter supporters club. Supporters club. Thank yeah. you. I was going to say fans club at first, but <laughs> no, it's supporters club. Uh, so we got to sit down with him, and we uh, we talked about what they're all about. I don't know if you want to kind of lead in with anything with this clip here, or sure. not really a clip, Let's really. It's it like a segment. This, so uh, if you if you ever go to the game and you see them, they sit in uh, two eighteen section, mm -hmm. and they put up a banner. Um, sometimes multiple banners. They have some other stuff, yeah. you know, depending on the game. But uh, if you're ever wondering who they are and what they're all about, here's a clip and interview with Curtis to talk about it. So uh, we're still here at Fan Fest, and now we're here with uh, another special guest of ours, uh, the I guess leader, would you say, 
Uh, I've been called fearless leader before. Okay. <laughs> fearless leader. The fearless that's, that's leader. That's what they called me. Right. <laughs> fearless leader of the Teal City crew. Uh, you are basically a fan support. How, how would you describe it? Yeah, so uh, imagine a soccer supporters club, okay. or a supporters club, uh, but in the arena yeah. instead of in a soccer stadium. Right. <laughs> and so, uh, very fittingly, uh, this season they're going with the whole hashtag Teal Together, and uh, that kind of fits right into what your whole mantra with the Supporters Club is. Yeah, so uh, it's it's about bringing fans together. Yeah. I mean, that, I think that's what, it, that's what uh, not necessarily we've lacked, but something that we could grow even more on. Uh, from either in the arena to, heck, I'm talking just now to our SoCal chapter. So we're doing SoCal chapter stuff. Nice. Uh, where we're getting 200, 300 people showing up to events uh, at the games in Anaheim and LA. That's great. Um, yeah. Uh, tell us, uh, tell us how you got started. Like, where, where did it all begin? Uh, so we started about. Uh, actually, we're celebrating our fifth anniversary uh, out in uh, January. Uh, so we'll be doing, rolling out some events uh, based on our anniversary. Cool. Uh, I was the chapter president of the American Outlaws, largest U.S. supporters club in U.S. soccer for both men's and women's. I got even more involved with it, with soccer, and I wanted to do something with my love for Sharks nice. hockey. I then saw cool. videos of people in Europe doing these crazy stuff <laughs> with flares indoors yeah. and <laughs> flags indoors. It, it's basically soccer nuts. hooligan hooliganism indoors, which exactly. is even scarier. <laughs> but, yeah. And I think, I think that's a, a, a great topic real quick, uh, yeah. is is uh, what's the difference between, you know, like, are, are these guys going to be like uh, the folks that came in for the Barracuda game? Are they going to distract us from the game itself? Mm -hmm. No. The answer is, simple answer is no. We're, we're a supporters club. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, an ultra and a, and a hooligan are up here. Uh, then, you you know, you have your, your diehard supporters. And then you have your supporters right underneath that are a uh, supporters club that try and gets you uh, pumped in and be an additional part of the team. Right. And I think it's a little more inclusive than, than like a Ultras fan. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we were actually accepting of all people. Right. There's no membership. Yeah. There's no, uh, you know, if you want to wrap a scarf, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, you don't have to pay anything. If you're a member, you're a member. Cool. And, and so what are some of the things that becoming a member kind of does for you, really? And then on top of that, what events uh, are you kind of organizing so that people know uh, what to look out for if they do become members? So in town, in San Jose itself, we're doing uh, watch parties at houses nice. sometimes, uh, all the way to uh, venues. So, you know, larger bars that have projectors, uh, we've done it, you know, at corporate chains. We'll do it, we'll do it anywhere that you know they'll give us dedicated sound and uh, sound and video, which yeah. is even in San Jose a little hard when you have football. You got a very successful basketball team. Yeah. We're trying to get that clientele to climb up and have Sharks fans come in and uh, just have more yeah. fun. Yeah. Together. Teal together. together. Teal exactly. together. Watching is better together. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned you have an L.A. chapter, so any of you L.A. fans that are looking to find some other Sharks fans, feel free to find them. Yeah, we're at uh, TCC SoCal on uh, both uh, Twitter and uh, Instagram, or just search T Teal City Crew SoCal on Facebook. Is there any other chapters possibly opening? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we also have our Sacramento chapter. Those guys are crazy. They're yeah. they're having always they're always having fun <laughs> in uh, Fat Chad's in um, Citrus Heights. Uh, yes. So if you guys are ever out in Sacramento, definitely go out, uh, come out there. Uh, what else do we have? We have Portland that's just starting this year, uh, which I'm really excited for. Uh, there's about ten or fifteen people. It's There's a lot, a of, lot of people nice. moving out of the bay and going oh, up yeah. to Portland and we Seattle. Had, and we had a Texas chapter. Yeah. Uh, actually, like I said, our SoCal chapter president, yeah. he was um, our uh, Dallas chapter president for a little bit. And nice. when we had the Allen Americans, uh, where we had 40, 50 people that are diehard Dallas Stars fans watching the Sharks just because <laughs> yeah. that's their parent team. They got to yeah. see their boy Aaron Dell come up the ranks, <laughs> yeah. and that was cool. Yeah. That's nice. awesome. So one other thing I wanted to ask about, and uh, it was with the banners and whatnot. Sometimes we see the banners that are up there, right? But there was yeah. one time there was a very special banner that was all over <laughs> social media. He knows what I'm talking about already. The Mike Hoffman banner. Mike Hoffman, So give us yep. a little bit of rundown on how that whole uh, thing kind of unraveled and progressed. We're going to go AM to PM. Uh, that banner was done day of. <laughs> wow. We were, we were way behind schedule. Basically, uh, a few months before we said, 
oh man, this guy was a shark for a few hours. <laughs> he was very controversial. Let's let's poke the bear a little bit. And uh, so we paint, we got it uh, chalked up. That's what we'll do. We'll use a projector and chalk up the lines. Um, SAP Center has been so gracious to let us do stuff like that and be creative, uh, which is absolutely awesome. Both the Sharks and Great. SAP Center independently, oh, yeah. um, or respectively, would be right. Yeah. Um, then uh, that night uh, we hung it up, and the story goes: um, Luongo saw it during the <laughs> national anthem because they're all looking that in this direction, yeah. and they go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the entire team saw it. Uh, I'm outside of the arena when I get a, a tweet from uh, the Florida Panthers PR guy. Nice. He goes, hey, Mike wants the banner. <laughs> and I said, Ar all right, uh, can you come tomorrow at 11 a.m.? We, we've got a practice here at SAP Center. Uh, Mike would like to meet you and the team would like to meet you. I go, all right. Come down these stairs. Panthers are practicing. Even the ownership was here, which was crazy. They were doing their one of their West Coast tours to yeah. watch their boys play. And here comes Mike in his <laughs> gear, coming off the ice early to you know get dressed and come up meet me. Roberto Luongo comes to the glass and starts laughing. <laughs> starts banging on the boards. Everybody starts cheering. Mike's coming up as they're about to finish the practice, and all the guys start hitting the sticks on the ice. It was nice. That's pretty cool. He he acknowledged the heckle. He knows you know, yeah. not super supportive of him, but right, you know, yeah. uh, we're still you know respectful. We're still gonna give him a little jab. And then the cool part is we did get a, a jersey out of it. So That's we got nice. a Hoffman uh, Florida Panthers jersey. Yeah. Most random jersey in yeah. my closet right now. Uh, keep a lookout for the next Florida Panthers game here at home. Because yeah. nice. uh, the legacy is not over. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> the era. Circle that one on the calendar. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, talk about circling calendar. We will yeah. be doing a bunch of banners, including opening night. Nice. Uh, Lips are sealed. We're not doing anything. Uh, we're not announcing anything. No theme. Some people know it. Some people don't. No pictures when they're making them. It's going to be a surprise every game you guys come in, and we have one plan. So you definitely keep do, a lookout. At the top of two eighteen. You do one maybe like once a month. Once yeah, we're planning on that. that. Uh, obviously, against uh, the big, the, bigger, the, the bigger ones yeah. at Dallas. Yeah. Uh, again. Right. Easy. <laughs> Easy to infer what, oh, yeah. what it could be about. Uh, yeah, I think it started with uh, with the Anaheim, the Duck Hunt, like yeah, yeah. Uh, Nintendo Entertainment System banner. But we're 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 focusing on painting and making them big. And this year, uh, opening night, like I said, you definitely want to keep your eyes open because that's going to be. Now, are you talking cool. banners like you've been doing hanging, or a typo where you're going to do the section similar we're, to so soccer? So. We're going to be doing hanging uh, okay. just because of uh, fire hazards. It's a little different indoors. Got it. Uh, yeah. But we will be having fan interaction. So if Got you're it. interested in sitting with 218, you get an experience with the section, which I think Very is cool. That's cool. Uh, bringing in a little bit more interest and in bringing in people, uh, especially into next year when we're going to be accepting season ticket holders in our section, both new and uh, transferring from other sections. Cool. Great. Very yeah. cool. I love that. Yeah. Are you any more other questions you got there? I think that's all I got. I'm off the hook again. This is <laughs> Curtis. Uh, why don't you go ahead and plug your socials one more time so they know? Yeah. So our main chapter is going to be at Teal City Crew on everything, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, SoCal chapter. If you want to find a chapter, it's probably there, Midwest, Portland, uh, Sacramento, uh, SoCal. Did I say SoCal? I think you did, SoCal. yeah. <laughs> Any of them, you can always just reach right out to them, uh, yeah. and then they can probably just go ahead and interact with you directly. So, uh, again, hey, thanks for uh, for popping by. Absolutely. Really cool. Going. We love seeing the banners up there all the time. Oh, so the Someone Somebody just made the shot. Yeah. <laughs> what a way to go out. So that was our, our whole interview with uh, with Curtis. Uh, really nice guy, and uh, the Supporters Club does some really awesome stuff with the banners and whatnot. I think that Mike Hoffman story is yeah. phenomenal. It's great. So good. Yeah, so uh, go ahead and give them uh, a look, see what they're all about, and uh, I don't know, maybe end up joining the club. That'd be, that'd be great. Yep. Very cool. Okay, so now we have our week ahead. Correct. And our week ahead segment will be brought to you by our sponsor, Berticelli's La Villa Gourmet Italian Delicatessen. <laughs> 
So uh, they are located in Willow Glen and they are a phenomenal little shop. They've got all kinds of sports memorabilia in there, specifically sharks as well. Uh, some of the sharks players actually show up to have their lunch there. They have the Chris combo, which is great. They have all kinds of Italian food, uh, meatball sandwiches, ravioli is really, really popular mm -hmm. over there. Um, so definitely go give them a look. Uh, they are a really great little place to eat. I would advise that you get there early for lunch or very late for lunch right. <laughs> because the rush is is uh, something to behold. The rush is real. You can also call in ahead of time if yes. you know what you want. There you that go. Helps. Probably the safest way to go is to call in ahead right. of time. Anyway, uh, thanks again to our sponsor, uh, the La Villa Delicatessen. So now we are going to talk about the week ahead of us. Yes. So we've got a whole slew of away games. So go ahead and kick us off. Four games this week. So they're going to play Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday. Tuesdays oh against Buffalo, which is fantastic because the way the Sharks played in the last game, I think... Um, it, it's kind of weird that game because I feel like they, yeah, they lost, but it felt good. Like if to me, it felt like they played well, other than the mistakes that they made. You clean up those mistakes, you're going to win more games than you're going to lose. So I'm not too worried about the Buffalo game. I think it's great that they get to go right back at it and uh, play against them, kind of like the Vegas game, I guess back to back, but not quite. But the Vegas, not Vegas, yeah, the Vegas loss, we did not feel good coming no, out of that. The, exactly. the Buffalo That's, loss, right? They're right. playing better as a whole. Anyway, I feel like the Sharks should be able to win this game and probably will. Um, and then Thursday, they're going to go into Montreal, which is always a tough place to play. Um, I think we're going to see Aaron Dell in this game just because they're playing back-to-back -back against Toronto. And to me, Toronto's the stronger team of the two. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to want a, a, a fresh Martin Jones versus a fresh Aaron Dell, I suppose, if they were to swap which games they want. Um I wouldn't be surprised if Pete DeBoer completely just disagrees with me and puts Martin Jones in against Montreal <laughs> and uh, Dell in against Toronto. But that's that's if I were the coach, that that's what I would do. Because there's two schools of thought here, right? One is you put your best pl uh, goalie up against the weakest team to try to guarantee those two points, or you try to match your goalie strength to the opposition strength. Right, and right? Montreal's not a terrible team. They're not a sure. basement dweller, so it's not like... They're going to be playing against Ottawa on Sunday, which is who they're going to <laughs> we'll get on, on Sunday. Uh, but I think um, going into Montreal is going to be tough. Um, and Friday game against against Toronto is going to be even tougher. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to really dig down deep to get those legs moving. Um, and you're going to see um, it's almost a scheduled loss. So if the Sharks go down early against Toronto, they're going to be in trouble. If they get up early... Uh, you're going to see them try and hold on to that win and get those points, and you're probably going to see a barrage coming at the end of the third period from Toronto because they know the Sharks are going to be exhausted from the night before. Um, so that's three games in four days. Mm -hmm. That's pretty brutal. And then they get one more day off, they travel to Ottawa, and they're going to play Ottawa on Sunday. Um, that game they should win, and I think they're going to still semi-fresh in their minds playing last year in Ottawa mm -hmm. when that was Carlson's first game back and they played terribly. I think Carlson, if I remember correctly, Carlson was the only one that actually looked good in that game. The rest of the team was just terrible. And that was before they went into the GM meeting, I believe, yeah. that they had. So um, I think the Sharks are going to want to kind of avenge that a little bit and for Carlson's sake, play better as a team and get those points. So for me, I think realistically, I'd be happy with Five to six of the possible eight points. Okay. So we're talking two wins, maybe one loss in regular in uh, overtime or shootout, and then maybe one regulation loss. So you think uh, right away, you think the Toronto one's probably going to be the regulation loss then? If I had to guess, mm -hmm. yes, but knowing the Sharks, it'll probably be the Ottawa game. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they probably win win the first three and then lose the Ottawa game, but yeah. Yeah, you just never know which team's going to show up. Yeah, exactly. Right? Okay. Well, are we done with the week ahead? We Actually, there is one more game that we're... It's not in this week. There is. It's just the road trip ends on Tuesday. So right. they're playing Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday, Tuesday. It's a pretty brutal trip, and that last one's in Boston. Uh, but we'll talk about that game next week when yeah. we have our next show. You kind of wonder if they would rather play that many games on the road, just get them all done and out of the way, or if you they would rather be gone for a while with all the travel and all that stuff. I think it's know? less about that and more about getting as many points as they can, and yeah. the best way to do that is probably not back-to-backs and up. traveling, mm, yeah. right? So back-to-backs at home is one thing. Back-to-backs on the road is another. Yeah. So that's just brutal. 
Well, something to look forward to at least. So uh, four games uh, this week, and uh, the fifth game being the last one of the road trip. So mm-hmm. it's going to be a fun show on episode sixty-one. Yes. So uh, with that, we're done with the uh, with the week ahead. So we're going to do just a quick little segment here with the EASHL and the fantasy. So for EASHL, we're just going to go ahead and put up the PS4 rosters right now. It shows you all the stats. And uh, yeah, looks like I'm I'm doing okay there. You, you're still doing yeah, pretty I'm good st- there I'm too, not but too bad. I didn't play that much this week. Right, but I'll probably pick it up again this week. Okay, well then we're gonna go ahead and throw the uh, Xbox one up there as well. Maybe still a little light, but yeah, that's okay. There's like one guy that's really playing. Yeah, but there that's a lot of negative right there. Okay, a lot of minus. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, if you guys are interested, please go ahead and join EASHL on NHL 20 for either Xbox or PS4. Aaron and I are playing on the PS4. Uh, because we don't have Xboxes, but search for TFF as the abbreviation. If you just do like all, um, what's it called? Regions, I guess? All regions. You just search all regions. Abbreviation. Yeah. TFF. You should find it. Should find it. So uh, that's pretty much it. Now, normally we would add a like little clip of a, a nice goal or something like that, but no, nobody's, sending, <laughs> nobody's sending any clips. And sin for the win. Uh, Zinxie, where are you guys? Come on. Throw me some of your clips. You don't even Seriously. have to be in the club Come anymore. On. Just. Help us out a little bit. Anyway, <laughs> done with that. Again, if you guys are interested in joining, it's open. Just pop on in. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, well, let's take a look at the fantasy leagues. Uh, here's the standings for the fans for the first fantasy league. As you can see, there's a certain person at the top. I don't. Who who is? Oh, oh, I'm winning. I'm winning. Uh, this is after two weeks. Uh, I'm in first place, which is fantastic. So let's uh, let's jump over to the second league now. And oh, oh my, what? <laughs> Who, who is that on top again? Oh, wow. <laughs> Dominating two leagues. Granted, it's two weeks in. We don't want to talk too much about the there standing so early, you know, that kind of thing. But it's better than being at the bottom looking up. So how about that? That is true. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I guess that does it. So uh, do you have anything else you want to add here? We're all good. Uh, please visit our store. Okay. You can get some swag if you go to thefinfactor.com. Uh, check out our apparel. We have... You can see the gray shirt right behind me. We have gray, we have teal, we have black, we have black women's deep V cut shirts, we have hats, and we have stickers, and all the proceeds help us with the show. And speaking of proceeds, please make sure that you are subscribed and you've got that notification bell hit because we have our live shows and we just got some uh, super chat uh, money did. from the folks there, yeah. which is awesome. We certainly do appreciate you guys uh, helping us out financially. Uh, it certainly goes towards uh, the show and making it. Uh, everything that you guys like so uh, we appreciate that so anyway you can help us out in terms of support we love it thank you so much okay so we're all good right oh one last thing one last thing thank you for the 2,000 subscribers oh that's right 2,000 how did I forget yeah 2,000 subscribers guys I cannot believe it honestly when we started this I thought that we would hit maybe about 300 400 by this (laughs) point and like half of it being like friends and family so The fact that we've got up to 2,000 already, it just blows my mind. And, and really, I just want to say thank you so much for all the support that we've had, all of the uh, the interactions that we've had. We're going out to like seeing people at Costco, and, hey, Fin Factor, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's really, it's just amazing the amount of support and, uh, and that you guys are just enjoying what we're doing. I mean, uh, when we started doing this, it was just, hey, we, we just want to talk about the sharks and <laughs> we'll throw it on a camera, right? right. And it, you guys seem to like it, so I, I, I appreciate it that you guys tune in and please feel free to share this with all of your friends and get them to uh, to subscribe to us as well because if you like it, they probably do too. Anything else? That's it. Okay, well that does it. Whoop, over here. <laughs> that does it for uh, episode number 60. Rook Shark Team. And uh, I guess that's it. So we will see you guys <laughs> next week. <laughs> next week. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, check out our other content, especially interviews. You can interact with us directly through social media at The Fin Factor and on Instagram at Fin Factor. And don't forget to join our live streams on YouTube. Visit our website at thefinfactor.com where you'll find all of our episodes as videos or podcasts. You'll also find our exclusive merchandise to help support our show.